Yes, welcome to today's lecture series. Uh, we're going to discuss something on data cleaning. Want to see how we can be able to use uh, Python programming language with available packages and libraries for us to be able to clean our data. Normally, in the process of data collection, we we end up encountering a lot of uh, errors, which errors can end up affecting the quality of the models that you're going to build at the end of it all. So in this particular case, I have uh, some data set which I want us to walk through together. It's data set in, uh, regarding uh, some information about diabetes patients. So first of all, we're going to call our desired libraries, which libraries will help us be able to uh, display and process the data in the way that can help us be able to make some better decisions. So given that data is, our data is a CSV file, I'll import pandas and take it as PD. And as well, because I, I may have to do some bit of um, graphical processing, so it's better we import a freeborn uh, as CNS so that we can have those interactive packages. So if I run that, that compiles effectively. So let me import my data set. I've saved it on my documents on my computer. So I'll use the pandas library to read that CSV file. So meaning that is pd.readcsv. And then I'll pick the link where that data is. So after doing that, we could actually be able to view that by just checking on our data frame. And here we are. We have 109 rows and 14 columns of our data. And our data has details about the serial number, the patient, uh, the ID, the patient number, though this is a spelling error that we can see, they're taking it as number passion. So it means we shall have to work on this trait. We have the gender, age, and then we have the various tests that they did in, in that patient. And the tests here, we have urea, uh, HbA1c, cholesterol, among its others, body mass index. And at the end of the day, the patient was classified to either be diabetic or not diabetic or is just a patient who has not yet been diagnosed. So uh, to make, uh, to simplify our work, maybe viewing all these rows would be a little tedious, I would put dot head, so that we just see the first six rows only uh, to simplify the kind of data that we are viewing. So if that's the case, since I've seen that there's an error first that I want to correct, and maybe we may not be able to understand some of these features, would as well be able to correct them. So I want to view the respective columns to check them the respective columns as they are so that uh, i can actually be able to uh, probably pick the column names that i want to change and things like that so in this particular case i'll still use my data frame dot columns and i'll press my shift enter and we have our columns here so specifically we want to change this column and maybe as a computer scientist or a data scientist we may not be able to understand some of the parameters that you have used here we could as well be able to change them to parameters that we can easily understand. So in this particular case, let me first change uh, the number passion, patient number, so that we can actually be able to, uh, we can actually be able to, to have a clear table that we can use for our data processing. So to change that, <clears throat> I will just do a rename of my data frame. And what I'm renaming here is the columns. And uh, specifically, I'm renaming the column and uh, number passion and i'm renaming it to patient number patient number and the, uh, to make sure that uh, the change that i'm doing also gets reflected into my final csv file that i'm going to export i'm going to declare my in place value to be true so meaning if i put it to be false it will only be changed for my to only change for my processing here but the final export wouldn't have it so if that's the case, then I can press my shift enter to run this. And the fact that that has compiled, it shows that that has been effectively changed. So we could easily view to see the change that we've done by entering df.columns. And here we are, we see successfully our, our column uh, number passion has been changed into patient's number. So uh, after doing that, we may actually also experience some missing values. I saw when I entered initial values, I saw some parameters which were reading NA. Uh, so we need to know how many entries are, meeting, are missing per respective column. 
So for us to be able to check for missing uh, uh, for missing values in the columns, we need to be able to, to run a, a script which is going to help us do that. So I could say from my data frame, I need to check whether it is now as a function. And what this one is going to do is going to to display my information in the same tabular structure. But that is going to be confusing. How are we going to look through all the 1009 rows that we have? So the best is let's let it add it <clears throat> column by column so that we can actually be able to use it for analysis. So to do that, I will bring in a dot sum function and then I can run this. And here we are. If we look at the ID number, does not have anything missing. The patient number is zero. Gendos are zero. But when I come to age, I have one value which is missing. You I have one. And among us, the other entries. So we need to work on these missing values. So if we see values that have so many missing values, okay, there would be two normal processes. One process is completely omitting those entries which are missing. Uh, and the other process is for us to replace those missing entries with the main of the other values. So if we look at that, like if we look at this particular test HbA1c, if I look at this test, this figure 3 is a lot. We don't want to miss this data because we need a lot of data for training our machine learning algorithm. So in this particular case, I think I'll replace this value with the main value, and then I'll omit off the rest which just have one, one uh, figure that's missing. So in that case, let me get my main value. And the minimum value that I'm getting is for the column HBA14 in the data frame. So I'll write that as this. And at, at the end of it all, I'll, I want it to help me calculate the mean. So if that's the case, then I can display my mean value. And uh, I can see my mean value in this particular column is 8.2814 and so on. So if that's the case, then can I fill... Uh, all those missing values in this column HBA1C with the mean value that I've gotten of 8.28. So to effectively do that, I'll still call my column in the data frame. And then I'll use the function fill NA, meaning fill values which are not available. And what it is filling it with, I want it to fill with the mean value that I've calculated. And it should keep this change as a permanent change. So I'll use the in place function b equals to true. So if that's the case, I compile this and I see my 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 Jupyter notebook has actually compiled it. It means my Python has been able to recognize that change. So I could still be able to view and see if there is still a missing value in that particular column. So meaning I'll use data frame dot is now dot sum because I want it to add for me those features. And if I look at that, I can see my row for HB, my column for HBA1C is now zero, meaning it does not have any missing value. So on the same note, these ones which have just one or two missing values, I want them to be omitted. So to effectively do that, um, let me declare and say deleting uh, the missing values in my data set. So to effectively do that, it means I'm going to generate a new data set. I want to call it data, data frame one. And in this case, I will drop all values using the drop NA function in the old data, man, that data set. So I mean that is df.dropNA as a function. And when I run this, I can see the compiler has recognized that chain. And so I can view uh, whether there is again another missing function in my new data set df1. So meaning I'll use df is now as a function dot sum and uh, I press shift enter and here we're good to go. We can now see that all the values now are 0, 0, 0, meaning there is nothing more missing and it means all functions have been effectively done. That's one core way we can actually be able to deal with missing values and successful also we have looked at how we can be able to replace terms which maybe could be due to typing errors or parameters that you as a computer scientist may not be able to understand. So the other thing that I want us to be able to check, uh, let's check the particular data types which are available for all the data that we have in the columns. So specifically, I'm going to be using my column df1 as my reference columns. So let me first declare and put that as a comment, checking for general information about df1. 
So what I'll do, I'll say df1.info as a function, and then I'll press my shift enter. And here we can see that uh, for ID and patient number, these are integer values, meaning they are numeric values. For gender, it's recognizing it as objects. An object can be a character, it can be a character mixed with integer values, it can be uh, something, it can be a mix of floating characters with floating numbers with integers and characters. So we need to check these two values because anything that's declared as, a, uh, as, as an object may in most cases have a lot of challenges that we'll want to know about. So to just be sure, uh, we need to check for the uniqueness. How unique are these object data types that, that have been declared? Like if I look at my gender here and my class, how unique is class and gender? So to be able to do that, I just want to copy this class because I don't want to make a mistake in typing. Uh, Python notebook is case sensitive. Uh, uh, so to do that, I want to say, let me check for check for uh, uniqueness in the data. And to do that, I'll still make a reference to my data frame one, and I'm going to group my data group by, and I'll group it by the particular class that I'm picking. So in this case, it's class, the one that has either uh, not patient or, or not diabetic or diabetic, or maybe somebody who is a patient. So in this particular case, I'm going to check that group having uh, that column name class. And uh, to effectively confirm that, I'll also still have to call in that column class using the square braces. And then I'll want it to aggregate it so that it counts for me. So I'll use the count count function. So if that's the case, then I can run this. And indeed, we see there's something tricky here. Like it tells us that there are two categories of no and there are two categories of yes. So that means one of the categories could have been typed wrongly. And because it has been typed wrongly, now it's displaying it and recognizing it as a new character. Mm -hmm. So we need to be very sure. Let's confirm how unique that particular class is. I'll say my class column in the data frame one table dot unique as a function. And then I run this, we can effectively see that uh, this n and this n, I think there is an element of space between the other n, and that's why they declared it. And this is also the same thing. So we need to merge up these values. In an ideal case, it's just the same thing, but because of the typing errors, that challenge was made. So to effectively do that, I'm going to, to check for duplicates. And uh, after checking for duplicates, I'll actually do my DF1 uh, as a as a as a as a, a table and as well specifically reference to that particular column to be equals to df1 reference to that particular column dot string dot replace the y with space that's what i've chosen to use dot with the y without space and i could do the same thing i will just copy this and i do the same thing and replace it also with the with my no so meaning instead of this y, I'll just take it as n, and then also this I'll take it as n. And since that is clear, we can compile this, and uh, our compiler has recognized that change. So meaning we could again go ahead and copy this, and we check whether these, the functions are still repeating, to check how unique these respective functions are. But now finally we see all the three values are changed, and even if we want to check on our class, uh, to group those respective uh, features in our class. I'll just copy and paste this, and I press Shift Enter. We can now see that from the 102 and 1, those ones have now been added to give us 103, and then the 832 plus 9 that has been added to give us 841. So meaning this mistake has also been sorted. So always do that for object that types. Good. We may also be interested, let's check on the other object gender. What is unique about it? Uh, so to do that, I want to still copy this command, but then I just replace wherever this class, I replace it with, with gender. And if I copy that gender and I replace it here, replace it also here, and I, I run this command, I can see that 
there are also two cases of female. There is female with capital F and female with small f. Now, the, the, the programming language Python is recognizing that as two different, uh, different together uh, uh, status. So to, to solve that, we did as well to, to merge up the small f, replace small f with capital F. And then we see how it can go about. So I can still copy this. And then after copying that, I paste it here. And then I just replace whatever this gender, I mean, whatever this class, I want to replace with gender. And then instead of uh, capital N, in small f, let me replace it with capital F. And then I run this. And when I run this, I, I see it has successfully added it up. And because of that, I'll still go back and do my, uh, my account and see whether that change has been reflected. And there we are, we see from 432 plus 2, which gives us 434 here. So it means our data has been effectively managed. So since there are no more object variables, object data types, uh, we can now check other features. Normally we do that for the object variables. You can also check for the rest. It's not criminal for you to try. It helps you to be able to, uh, to understand uh, the specifics that take place. So the other most important feature that I want us to check also in these floating characters is to be able to confirm uh, if there are any outliers within our work. So to check for outliers in this particular case, uh, I want to check for outliers within my data. So if I have to check for outliers within my data, I'll have to display the box plot. So I'll use the CNS. I'll have to, dis to use the CNS function to be able to display that box plot. So using cns.boxplot, uh, I'll take df1 as my table, and I want to check specifically a particular column. So in this case, let me check my column. I could check this, maybe any of this. There's no particular formula. Check for all functions which are floating values and see how they are. So in this particular case, I'll check that value. So when I plot that, uh, we can all see that there is this value of somewhere around 800, which is uh, uh, not very clear. It's confusing us actually. It's far, far above the rest. So in most cases, if you see maybe you're measuring heights of students, and every student is between uh, is between maybe one meter to one and a half meters or three meters, then you see this particular case where a student is getting up to 80 meters. So it means you will start wondering how possible, how different was the student from other students that we have, and why is that height difference so big from the rest of the students. So this is what we call an outlier. So those outliers normally need to be treated, because if you don't treat them, that means they, they compromise with the quality of your output. And you have to work on that before you start training your model. So to effectively achieve that, I would want to choose a quartile, a quantile, and fill it with the outliers. And to effectively do this, uh, in probability, the error bound that they allow us to take is around 0.5%. So if we do 0.5%, that's 0 0.5 over 100, that gives us 0 0.005. 0 .005. So if I subtract that from 1, it means I'll end up getting 0 0.995 because our total probability is 1. So that's the figure, the region that I want to inspect. Maybe just to look at this box plot, if I divided this from into four portions, I will see that the last portion is where that outlier is failing. So I would want to investigate on the extremities of that last quarter and see what happens with it. So to effectively do that, I want to... Uh, to, to check on the maximum values of CR in that data frame one, specifically in the column CR. And uh, I want to check its quantile at the extreme point of 0 0.995, at that allowable uh, error bound. So if I decide to check my uh, tool to display that value, we can see that the value that is taking to be maximum is 401, which is seen here. The maximum value is averaged 401, meaning anything outside that is an outline. 
So I would be interested at displaying, uh, I want to be interested at displaying data, which is all of that, that, of that CR test, which is all greater than the maximum value of 401 that we've gotten. So I'll do that in uh, IDF1, in that particular column CR, and I'm picking all values which are greater than the maximum of that CR. And if I check that out, oh, it's picking some error. Which error we need to sort? Where is that error coming from? It's coming from here. And uh, we do have this also on our side. And if we do that, that should be able to print out very good. So if I look at the values that they are split, it has splitted four values. Uh, mm -hmm. That is uh, ID 1, ID 2, 66, ID 1, and ID 19. So all those values have 800 as their, as their CR test. So to effectively delete this, I want to assign the remaining data set, which is less than the maximum CR value, to my new table DF2. So I'll call my DF2 to be equals to the DF1. In the DF1 table, specifically the CR column, and my emphasis is to pick out all the data which is less than the maximum CR value that we got. And if I compile this, I would want to confirm the change. And to confirm the change, I want to view that from my box plot. So I'll use cns.boxplot. And then I will do my DF2, that stable DF2, specifically a column CR. And if I print this, if I print this, it's giving me a runtime error. Which runtime error? Needs to be investigated. Where is it coming from? It's telling me mm, DF2 is not recognized and uh, it's warning me because of that character CR, which is very clear here. here. The column is not small R, it's capital R. That's what's displaying here. So that's the error that I've made. It's very important to learn how to troubleshoot errors because you're bound to incur most of them in your day to day work. And this is the graph that it shows. And, uh, I can see it has now ended somewhere around 401 and this one now has been sorted. The outliers here have been handled. We could also now look at another data file. I could look at probably maybe the HBA1C. Let me look at this. Let me try and display also and see its block box plot and see if it is normally distributed before I can be able to do anything on it. So to do that, I will still check my box plot cns.box plot and specifically i'll use my df2 table and refer to that particular column hb and one c and if i run that i clearly see a normal distribution the maximum being 16 the minimum being two and average lean uh, my mean is at around eight so that one is normally distributed you can check for all the other data set to be very sure that all the data that you're going to use will be free from outliers. Good, so uh, the other thing that I could be interested in, I want to check for duplicates because uh, in the process of building our machine learning algorithm, we would want to expose our algorithm to only unique variables so that our algorithm learns on the independent features of that unique variable and makes decision which can uh, help us be able to do other future predictions. For example, if we have specifically students, okay, maybe let's use our specific data set. If we have data that is very clear, like somebody of a particular weight and has a particular height, is diabetes positive when it, when it has particular kinds of this. If you have several data which is clear like that, that means you're going to bias your algorithm when it when starts learning. So it's better we expose one, the different features that make, that make up say a positive result of diabetes and also the different features that make up a negative result of diabetes. So if we can expose our algorithm to that, that means it will deal with the duplicates. So first of all, I want to check the duplicates. I'll say df2, the duplicated, duplicated as a function. And I just don't want it to tell me yes, no, yes, no for all the data. I want it to sum and tells me which particular 
how many in particular are duplicated so that we can be able to work on that. And if I see here, uh, my algorithm is telling me three features are duplicated. So I think to be better, we'll drop out those features because we don't need them. So I'll take my df3 to be equals to df2 dot drop duplicates, duplicates as a function. And if I do that, we see it effectively runs, meaning there is no problem with our data. And we can again go back and check the same feature to see if there are the three duplicates have been cleared out. Oh, and when I check that, it's still telling me, oh, I'm still referring on DF2. Now what? DF3, so that's now a new data frame. Let me check for it. And we can now see my DF3 has no duplicates. I could now be interested at displaying this data. Let me display it. So I'll just display df3.head because I want to just see the first six rows. And uh, great, it's amazing. We can see our title has been changed. And this data is clean and it's ready for us to be able to export it for building our machine learning algorithm. So for us to effectively export that, uh, exporting data, we export it to a particular partition, exporting data for building an ML algorithm. So for us to effectively do that, I will say my reference is df3. Dot, I'm exporting it to a CSV file and I'm assigning it a new name. I can just call it the habits or maybe clean the habits data. Clean the habits data. Dot CSV because that's our extension. And all this, since it's a string function, you need to put it in quotes and I run this. And the fact that it has run, that means effectively we have our data clear. And if I come to this, I can see my data set has just been created a few seconds back and this here. And everything is clean and ready for us to use for training our machine learning model. So uh, that is a brief snapshot on what uh, the data cleaning process is. And uh, our next series, we shall see how we can build a machine learning algorithm, maybe a linear regression model or any other model that can use that we can train from this data to help us be able to predict any other future test whether somebody will be diabetic or is not diabetic so for this particular day i close this lecture series from here and hope to see you in the next next lecture series thank you put any comments on my youtube channel so that we can be able to discuss it and uh, probably any comments are welcome and any other approach that we can be able to clean this data is also highly welcome